All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dwight Duffy, and in this lecture discussion, we're going to be talking about one of the most important contemporary issues in information technology, and that is privacy. What is privacy in the information age? What is it about information technology that makes privacy so hard to manage and maintain? So in this discussion, we're going to be talking about four things. We want to talk about the three constituents of privacy and a fourth wild card. That is to say, who is interested in privacy? The government's role in privacy. So we want to talk about that. We want to talk about three things that we value more than privacy. And this is really intended to be a provocative statement that suggests that there are things that <clears throat> we as individuals and that we as a society may value more than privacy, things that we are willing to give up our privacy for. So we'll talk about that. And then we want to conclude our discussion today looking at some of the specific aspects of privacy. Uh, and this will be a, a limited list as there, there are so many aspects of privacy, but we want to focus on a few uh, so we have an idea of you know, some of the major uh, privacy aspects in the information age. All right, so let's start with uh, talking about the th what, what <clears throat> we call the three constituents of privacy or who um, in our society is interested in privacy issues. Who wants to get uh, you know, information that might be considered private by uh, a third party or by somebody else. So let's start with that. Uh, the first constituent uh, group that's interested in privacy, of course, is you and me, individuals. Uh, individuals, uh, consumers, students, customers, all of those different ways of saying um, just individual regular people like you and me we all value our privacy uh, to some extent lesser or greater uh, degree um, some of us um, less than others but we all have some um, need and desire for privacy and so that's an important um, <clears throat> constituent uh, group that we have to consider when we're consider considering privacy all right in, in addition to individuals, consumers, students, customers, all of the usual suspects that make up kind of the, the individuals that are interested in privacy. There is the business interests. Uh, so businesses and uh, businesses have a huge uh, stake in privacy. Uh, businesses want to be able to um, keep their intellectual property private. Uh, they want to be able to uh, market to their customers. Um, they want to be able to try to extract the maximum profit uh, from information. Google mines it uh, in the clickstream. Walmart stores it in its data warehouses. Um, <clears throat> businesses are all about information and data. And so this intersection of the, the business interest and the individual interest uh, we see uh, come, <clears throat> come together here in this issue of privacy. So the business interest. And then finally, we have the government uh, interest in privacy. Uh, the government is the ultimate big brother tasked with keeping us safe. Uh, if you're cynical, um, trying to keep the status quo or the power structure in place, um, fighting foreign threats, uh, prosecuting lawbreakers, collecting information um, on <coughs> us uh, individuals and also keeping track of businesses. Uh, the government is um, involved in all of these things. As taxpayers, as drivers, uh, the government keeps track of information about, uh, about people and so the government, I think rightfully so, has a huge uh, interest in privacy. And then the fourth constituent group isn't really a constituent group as much as it is just a fact of life, and that is the bad actors, the uh, criminals, the terrorists, the spammers, the hackers, all the bad actors that are out there that are interested in um, getting our private data, uh, maybe um, hacking into business, 
maybe having a, a, a geopolitical um, agenda. And so as we consider these other three, we have to be aware that there are criminals, that there are terrorists, there are hackers um, out there, and uh, we, we have to uh, keep those we have to keep those threats in mind as well. Okay, so I think that is a good introduction to the three constituents of privacy. Uh, the government's role in privacy, kind of a simple idea here, and um, simply to say that there are three branches of government, legislative, executive, and of course, judicial so anytime uh, a major event happens 9 11 uh, there was a celebrated case famous uh, case of, of Megan uh, that led to Megan's law uh, we have the legislative uh, come up with some law some interpretation of how the uh, particular the particular aspect of privacy is going to be um, legally governed and regulated or controlled. Then we have the executive branch enforcing the law, and then finally we have the judicial branch actually adjudicating or uh, determining whether someone is guilty, um, and ultimately even constitutionally, whether something is, is constitutionally allowed or not. And certainly privacy is one of those issues that has often gone to the Supreme Court for, for um, constitutional review. We can't really overstate the extent to which there are laws that affect every aspect of privacy, whether it's in health care or education or in insurance, you name it, uh, there's probably a law uh, that regulates it. Cell, cell phones in bathrooms, there's a law. Um, what, what one can do with you know, video store records, there's a law about that. W what companies are allowed to do with GPS data, there's a law about that. And, and this is always changing, and um, the lack of, of prosecution or resources to actually prosecute may mean that even if there is a law, there may not be much in the way of actual um, recourse uh, for individuals or even businesses in a lot of cases. All right, and so <clears throat> finally, three things that we value more than privacy. And again, this is intended to be a provocative statement, but I think it's true. Uh, we all have our price, uh, even if we're, you know, say, yes, we value privacy, uh, what would be the things that we would maybe consider um, giving up some of our privacy for? First one is clearly safety and security. When we go to the airport, we're willing to take off our shoes, open our bag, subject ourselves to x-ray, all of this in the name of safety and security. Um, we have cameras up around on campus. Uh, we use passwords, um, you know, in order to be able to uh, biometric um, systems that we employ. All of these things uh, we're willing to uh, put up with uh, in the name of safety and security. And I don't think we can overstate, you know, the government's interest in safety and security in its role in all of the things that it's doing that m might even be um, considered over the line, even constitutionally speaking, in terms of maintaining our safety and security in terms of global threats and that sort of thing. So safety and security. Uh, the second one that I'm going to list here is convenience. Convenience. Oops, I should get this spelled correctly. Uh, we all are willing to give up a measure of privacy for convenience. You think about the fast track that lets you go on the toll road without stopping. You think about using a credit card. You think about um, you know, applying for a job, the convenience of being able to go to school, all of these things. Um, <clears throat> we give up a measure of our privacy for. A driver's license, 
you got to subject yourself to having your thumb uh, print scanned, um, giving up your um, you, a job application, you're going to give up your social security number, um, getting a loan, you know, the convenience of that, you're going to give up a lot of uh, information uh, <clears throat> as part of that process. So we're all willing to give up um, some privacy in order to have convenience. Cell phone, very convenient, but let's, you know, people, companies, the government um, know where you've been, uh, what you're doing, um, using a credit card, same thing. So convenience factor is a big one. And then finally, I think we all have a financial sort of, um, a financial cost or price. Um, and so we give up privacy for financial, not so much gain, but financial consideration, financial savings. Um, how many of you use Gmail or Hotmail or, or some free email service? Have you read the terms of service? Um, you've probably given up a lot of privacy in order to be able to use that, um, that free service. Financial considerations are actually all around us. If you've ever used a discount on a, um, you know, for, for a frequent, frequent flyer or frequent buyer or grocery discount uh, where you scan your card, again, the, the company is collecting information about your purchasing uh, habits in exchange for giving you a discount on your, on your purchases. Uh, free software in general, um, you know, is almost always uh, some trade-off of giving up something, some, some aspect of your privacy for getting something that's free. So financial considerations would be the third reason that we'd give up privacy. And I think if we look at um, just about any aspect of privacy, we would find that um, it's going to have uh, some sort of intersection with uh, one or more of these um, things that as a society and as in individuals that we, we value. All right, and so finally, uh, in this discussion, we're going to actually talk about some of the specific aspects of privacy. So we've talked about the fact that um, that there are three constituent uh, main constituent groups of privacy, uh, that there are individuals and, and um, the individual interest in privacy, there's the business interest in privacy, there's the government interest in privacy, and then we all have to contend and deal with the criminals, terrorists, hackers, and other bad actors. Uh, we understand that the context of privacy is almost always governed in the role of <clears throat> what the government is actually doing, and that is making laws, enforcing the laws, um, and, and then the judicial process uh, that's actually involved all the way up to the Supreme Court or constitutional level. And <clears throat> we want to understand that when there are privacy issues um, in play uh, that uh, there's often a trade-off uh, consideration for safety and security, for convenience, or for some other financial consideration, a cost savings or, or something like that. Okay, so let's talk about some of these um, aspects of privacy. I'm going to bring these over. And this is a, this is a pretty, um, I wouldn't say um, limited list, but it's certainly not exhaustive in any sense. And we simply want to get a sense for the extent to which uh, privacy uh, issues sort of permeate uh, so many different aspects of technology. So let's start with employee monitoring. Um, just taking a look at one. Um, employee monitoring is this notion that companies or the business interest has a right to know what the employee or the individual is doing. And it turns out that in this country, um, the laws that the government has passed, the legislative branch has passed, are very friendly to business, not surprisingly. Um, and if I go to Google and type employee monitoring, just to get an idea, look at all the advertisements for software and systems that let employers monitor their employees. Um, this is big business and there's lots of sort of sub aspects to this issue. I could type in, um, by the way, there are laws that govern what you would do with this, so don't take this as an endorsement, but Keylogger 
is software or hardware that lets me keep track of what people are actually typing on their computer. In fact, I could type in wireless keylogger. And there are lots of these little devices that the good guys, the bad guys, the government, or pretty much anyone else could hook into a computer that keeps track of the keyboard stroke, uh, keystrokes um, and could be monitored wirelessly. Again, this is highly regulated by law and if you do this for the wrong reasons or in the wrong way you are probably committing a felony. Uh, but the fact that this technology is out there uh, and this can be done legally by uh, employers um, is an indication of you know how complicated this this area or space is. Going back to um, employee monitoring thirty two million hits in Google coming back here even if I put it employee monitoring in quotes it's over half a million hits in Google so a huge issue uh, one that we could, you know, talk about, um, you know, do a whole whole section on. All right, let's get back to our list here. <coughs> Spyware, adware, email, and spam. I think we're all familiar with that and the scourge that is spyware and adware. Uh, so much of this um, is about trying to get in, into your click screen stream on your computer, trying to find out information about you, trying to um, take over your computer um, based on what you're searching for, what you're looking for, trying to redirect you or hijack your browser. Um, this is really a seedy world, uh, this whole uh, world of adware and email spam, and it's something that, you know, businesses legally actually um, are involved in and there are laws that regulate it but it's 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 largely unregulated and it's one of those things where if you try to get something for nothing or free or get some software or free utility there's a high chance that you may end up with some spyware or adware. Identity theft uh, big issue um, mostly dealing with that wild card that fourth constituent which is the bad guys somebody trying to get your credit card number trying to get your social security number trying to get something so that they can um, maybe just claw a foothold and be able to use your email account to be able to send out more spam uh, identity theft is although there are lots of laws that will protect you from identity theft the, the reality is there's very little executive enforcement meaning once you've had your identity stolen, it's difficult uh, to expect that anybody's going to prosecute the people that did it to you. There's simply not enough resources out there. Phishing is similar to identity theft. It's a technique whereby the bad guys will try to send out emails and get you to reveal some private information um, under the pretense of being a legitimate uh, company or organization. It could be a phone call, it could be an email, it could be a website that looks like a legitimate website and so phishing is one of those things that you want to be uh, familiar with and it's definitely um, it's definitely you know big business for the bad guys to be able to try to to get um, private information from individuals. Medical records privacy is highly regulated in this country. Uh, you probably heard of HIPAA. You could search for that. Um, the you know the, the the extent to which medical records are kept private uh, can also um, serve to sort of protect the the bad actors or the bad doctors, um, but it, this is something to to be uh, familiar with. Insurance underwriting and privacy. Uh, that's an interesting question. Can an insurance company use DNA um, results to underwrite insurance? Probably not. Can they use a blood test to um, to rule out, say, AIDS? Probably. Uh, in the future, as biotechnology and, and DNA and genomics and that sort of thing takes off, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of interesting um, questions about you know privacy in the age in which DNA can determine whether you have a you know a, whether you're predisposed to cancer or Alzheimer's or something like that. So. 
lots more going on in that uh, particular aspect of privacy. Criminal records privacy, think about Megan's Law, uh, think about um, you know the proposition in California that says that every criminal um, that's accused of a felony has to give up um, a DNA sample for a DNA database. Uh, these are all <clears throat> aspects of privacy uh, which really kind of go to safety and security uh, concerns uh, of individuals in general saying that uh, we're willing to give up the privacy of, of those who have um, committed crimes. Data mining, government and business use, this could be the government mining data, this could be um, big businesses like Walmart uh, who, who have huge data warehouses. You know, it's said that, that Walmart can know um, <coughs> You know, a company like Target or, or Walmart can know when somebody's pregnant just based on the sorts of things that they buy. Um, just little changes in buying habits um, with the type of food or the type of medication or the type of vitamins that people are buying, uh, they can determine things like that. So the question is, how do people actually use this, this data? There's all kinds of laws and government programs. Uh, Patriot Act, of course, came out in... Um, in the wake of 9-11. Of PRISM was just revealed um, by Edward Snowden uh, and this was the NSA um, spying um, accusation and there are many other government programs, most of which have to do with uh, safety and security ostensibly and um, again so we, we weigh this need for safety and security against um, the need for privacy. GPS and location tracking. Tracking. Um, this is a. This is one of the, the fastest growing areas of privacy. Cell phones, of course, have uh, required by law GPS tracking. Um, you can turn it on and off, but 911 calls are supposed to, of course, um, still have the GPS enabled. And this is obviously for safety and security. But there's all kinds of convenience factors to um, companies knowing where you are so they can give you the appropriate advertising or, or, or commercials and that sort of thing, but manifold privacy uh, issues that come up when you start thinking about computers that are tracking your location. All right, and we're going to finish this aspects of technology up by looking at three final items. Surveillance technology, that is to say uh, cell phone cameras now are everywhere. Um, black boxes are now uh, built into cars that, that monitor all kinds of uh, statistics for, of drivers. This is actually um, required by law now that, that new automobiles have a, what's called a data recorder or black box. Um, biometric devices now um, seem to be um, more and more common. RFID tags. Um, sort of like a barcode but a radio frequency identification tag. Very convenient. I mean this is the ultimate inconvenience. Uh, makes it very convenient. Uh, you could theoretically put RFID tags on all the grocery items and you could just push your cart through uh, out the door and the computer could track everything that you've purchased. It would eliminate cashiers. It could eliminate the need to stand in line. Uh, but that means that a computer right, is basically uh, you know, tracking all of these items in real time uh, with you know real time ac um, acquisition acquisition data acquisition devices P passports have actually had RFID tags in them for a while and there were concerns about privacy we use RFID tags for uh, things like uh, you know your fast track for going on the toll road uh, but RFID tags have huge privacy implications um, but give us mostly convenience. It's just a, a huge convenience factor um, to make things go faster if you don't have to stop, wait in line, that sort of thing. And then finally the issue of encryption. Businesses use encryption, the government uses encryption, um, the bad guys use encryption Encry and encryption is simply the notion that you know can I you know, lock up my data so that it's private and to what extent should the government be able to be able to break that encryption or be able to get in to see what's actually going on, um, particularly when it comes to national security. 
and I think we'd all agree that you know we want our credit card data to be secure we want businesses to use good encryption technology but encryption is that double-edged sword that if you provide absolute privacy then you you have a situation where uh, the bad guys can get away with you know with murder uh, so to speak so um, encryption is definitely here to stay um, and that's the final privacy aspect that we're going to look at here uh, in this um, abbreviated list of privacy aspects. All right, so that uh, concludes our discussion this week of uh, privacy and privacy issues. And we'll um, uh, see everybody next week.